about ladies and also to the viewers if you're logging on whether you're logging on to Torah anytime or to allsar.com or if you're a YouTube follower and subscriber we thank you so much for logging on uh, thank you so much ladies for coming especially the ones that have traveled all the way from Yerushalayim Ira Kodesh to be here at this Shi'ur um, it is incumbent upon me to give a special thank you to this tzaddik Yisrael. Yes, Ezra Barnea. What? Ezra Barnea. Yisrael Ezra? Yes. Yeah. That's right, Yisrael Ezra. Yes, yeah, the family is Ezra Barnea. No, but the name is your name. Yes, okay. Yisrael Ezra, who is my neighbor's son, who is a tzaddik, came today to help me with everything. He first of all he cleaned my entire mirpeset, my entire balcony. He he uh, dusted for me. He cleaned the the glass. That's why you're able to actually see through the windows. Because you know in Bet Shemesh with all the construction, you have to really dust every single day. Maud Nachon, he did the help with the floors, with the food, with everything. And he's an amazing, amazing helper, an Ohal Sara helper. Now Yisrael, he deserves a big round of applause. But Yisrael, I asked him, I told him, I'm going to ask you two questions that I want you to answer, that I want everybody, live on camera. Now everyone is looking at you, in all the world. On thousands of people. Two questions that I want you to ask them. Number one, what is number one? First, first, all. What made you feel the best? Like, what did you enjoy about coming to Lazor Ayom to help today? So he's saying it was hot and therefore just the, the, the sprinkling of the water revived him, made him feel good and he enjoyed. ומה עוד אהבת בזה שעזרת לי כאן לסדר והכל? הרכבתי את הנרות. אה, אוקיי, so behind you, um, we have some new uh, צדיקים uh, candelabras, and he put it all together for me, and he loved putting it together. למה אהבת לעשות את זה? זה נתן לי יותר שכל איך להרכיב. It gave him a little bit more, it developed his mind more to be able to put things together, and... ומה עוד? כיף לך שאתה עוזר לאוהל שרה? לארגון שלנו? למה? כי זה חשוב, זה... זה נותן את כוח, זה נותן את כוח. זה נותן את כוח. ומה עם הנשים פה שמגיעות? What about the women that come here? מה אתה אומר על זה שנשים צריכות להגיע לשיעורים? חשוב או לא חשוב? חשוב. למה? יש להם... They can develop more knowledge and wisdom. What does that do to the soul? They wisen it. It wisens the soul. It makes the soul broader and more expansive. Yisrael Ezra, you said, as I thought, השם ישמור אותך ויברך אותך וימלא את כל משאלות ליבך לטובה ולברכה. Tomorrow is his birthday. מזל טוב. שיהיה לך חיים טובים, ארוכים, מלאים בשפע והצלחה מרובה, שהקדוש ברוך הוא ירעיף עליך רק כוחות, כוחות, כוחות של רוחניות בעזרת השם. ושנזכה לראות אותך גודל להיות צדיק. ואוהב ישראל תמיד, כמו השם שלך, ישראל עזרה, שתמיד תהיה עזרה לישראל בעזרת השם. טוב. אוקיי. Ladies, this שיעור is being dedicated in a memory of סימן טוב משה הכהן בן תמרה, עליו השלום. His family wanted us to give שיעור מהו יר. 
and anyone here who wants to participate in Asheria, let me know. We'll talk about that the next time we come together. Um, we are now in the period of the nine days with the fast of Tisha B'Av just days away. And although our generation is filled with various escape routes and activities that tear us away from our spiritual responsibilities, still this is a time for us to focus on the reality, the reality of our people, to mourn what we lost along the way, and to seek out healing that can create uh, a peaceful <coughs> resolve across the gamut of our life. During this intense time period, we look inward to determine what could be done to create a closeness and a connection with the Ribbono Shel Olam. Perhaps that's why we don't listen to music, we don't eat meat or drink wine, there are no formal celebrations, we don't do anything that promotes a happy disposition. We intensify the mourning and the sadness, as the Gemara in Ta'anit states, Mishenichnas av, mema'atim besimcha. From when av begins, we decrease our gladness by disengaging from activities that could have otherwise given us some sense of comfort, relief and gratification. We don't indulge because we're meant to feel the discomfort. I was with, with a group of, of, of young ladies the other day and we went to Yerushalayim, to the Kotel, and, um, and on the way over there it was quiet in the car because there's no music. And they said to me, put on some music, this, I said, but, but it's well, the nine days started. I can't put on music. The nine days began. And they said, yeah, but we need it, and it's important. And I said, no, no, no. You feel uncomfortable without it? That's exactly what Hashem wants you to feel. You know, I mean, uh, you're supposed to feel that state of uneasiness, and it's supposed to remind you I'm in the galut. You know, many times um, I counsel, I counsel women, uh, and if I counsel somebody, counsel somebody, when we arrive at very uncomfortable places, as soon as we get to an area of life that's complex, uneasy, and difficult to talk about, almost immediately the patient wants to change the subject. Why? Why do you think? The most basic reason is that we don't want to deal with the difficulty, with the reality that we're in. We just want to put a band-aid on the wound and pray that it heals. We don't want to deal with the pain. We prefer to avoid it at all costs. So we ignore it. We disconnect from it completely. Some of us shove it under the rug. Some of us dismiss it. And then we assume that if we just choose to be happy, if we choose to be happy, we'll eventually be happy. But we all know that that's not true. Happiness is not a choice, like a button that when you press it, it magically appears. That's not happiness. Happiness doesn't come from pushing a button and saying, okay, today I'm going to sleep and choosing to wake up happy the next day. No. Happiness is a state of mind, and we'll soon find out how you get there. Happiness comes from within, from very hard work. It's avodah to be happy. The work that requires us to recognize the truth Happiness comes from emet, from the recognition of that pain, and to confront that pain head on. And work, avodah, means taking responsibility for the reality that we've created. It means we work through the pain 
changing our perspective and our mindset. And when we do that, when we've actually tackled the reality of our life and we didn't try to somehow avoid it, we'll find ourselves on the other side happier, more con content, and certainly stronger individuals. That's the first reason why we, we don't talk about it. The second reason why we have a hard time addressing the reality of our life is because we know that the moment we fully admit the truth to ourselves, what do we need to do? The moment we'll actually be real about things, honest enough to face ourselves and others with that truth, we may actually have to do what? Yes, sir. We may actually have to do something about it, whatever that doing means. And the doing is threatening and frightening to us. Taking necessary actions and not using all kinds of scapegoats and excuses is difficult. Not putting the blame on others and confronting our own selves with a plan of action so that our life is based on what's real and not based on fallacies and contradictions is threatening to us. The result is that we really think we're genuine and sincere people, when in reality we spend much of our life faking our way through things, through My neighbor doesn't understand a word of English, but she decided to be here. אנחנו מדברים על 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 לבדות את האמת בתוך האדם כדי להגיע לנקודת הסימCHA כי הסימCHA מגיעה מהאמת. And so, in reality, what do we do? We spend much of our life faking our way through many things, through relationships be it with our spouses, with our children, family, friends, neighbors, even with ourselves. And we begin to believe the falsehood we feed ourselves. We truly believe in that which is not real. In the sheker, אנחנו מאמינים בשקר. But the truth is always hitting us in the face somehow, some way. And what happens? That truth suddenly becomes the threat, the intimidating factor that we don't want to deal with. It's much too overwhelming. It's too intense. But worse. But worse. Chachamim say now the truth, the emet, takes on the face of sheker, oh. where we start to doubt the truth, question the truth, fight against the truth, push it away and out of our life. What's the result? What we call a vicious cycle. A pattern of events. A pattern of events that repeats themselves while you struggle to understand how, what, why did this happen? While simultaneously you try to come up with all kinds of sporadic solutions to try and better the situation. These days of Av, Yamim Shel Av, are about working through the pain. Not removing ourselves from it. They're about confronting harsh realities, not avoiding them at all costs. They're about once and for all being real and honest with ourselves, not only when it concerns one area of our life, but everything and everyone. These days are about recognition and change. They're meant to help us recognize the patterns, confront the tough realities, 
and most of all, they force us to take responsibility for our mistakes, for all the wrong choices we made, for the truths we did not want to face or admit, and all the falsehoods we clung to. These days are very therapeutic because they are meant to bring the destruction to the surface. It's to bring the khuban adama out for us to recognize the broken pieces we left behind to create the closures we left as open wounds, to put together what we tore apart, to admit the wrongdoings that we ignored, and to take accountability for the things we dismissed that should have been dealt with properly. So this time, as manshala khurban, when we talk about the destruction in such detail, where we, we tell the stories of all the terrible errors of Am Yisrael and how all those errors ultimately caused the devastation, they're meant as a healing mechanism. Kol asipurim shel achorban z'amur lerapot otach ki rak משהו שהחרבת, את יכולה לבנות מחדש. אבל אם את לא תתעסקי בחרב, בחורבן, אז איך תבני? את רק בונה, you're just building on חורבן. זה לא עובד. So basically, these days of Av are, they're a call from the past to the future, from our ancestors who experienced all the nisyonot of life to their descendants who seem to be repeating their patterns and their errors. So we're being called upon by a past time period to create a better future. And that can only happen when we confront the past and even the present, when we address it as hard as it is to do so, when we work through the falsehood, through the tragedy and all the pain, through the sadness, the confusion and the doubt. So listen very closely. The only place in your life where the answers lie, where joy awaits you, where Hashem is there to connect to, is the place of emet. emet. The only thing that will set you free, redeem you, and offer you a world of happiness, is emet. It's the world of truth. And the truth lies in the Torah. The entire psychology and spiritual anatomy of man is embedded in the Torah. The deficits of man lie in the Torah. The attitudes, the thoughts, the actions, and the blunders of man are inscribed in the Torah. At the same time, the hopes the vision, the strength of mankind is also addressed in the Torah. David HaMelech Alav HaShalom states in Sefer Tehilim, Torah Hashem Temima, the Torah of God is pure, it's perfect. And because it's pure, Meshivat Nafesh, it restores the soul. Edut Hashem Ne'emana, the testimony of God is faithful. Machkimat peti. It makes the simple person wise. David HaMelech Alav HaShalom is teaching us that faithfulness and truth, they go hand in hand. Zotomeret she emet ve'emunah. 
הולכים ביחד. Because you have faith in those you know are truthful and don't live behind walls of fallacy. And Hashem's Torah has and will always be faithful. Ne'emana, Torah Hashem ne'emana. And the faithfulness and the truth of Torah, machkimat peti. That's what's going to change the simple-minded person into a wise and happy person. That's what the next pasuk teaches us. What does he say, David HaMelech? Pekudei Hashem Yesharim. Hashem's orders, his requests are upright. And that position of Yashrut, Yashrut is the place of Emet, causes what? Next two words. Samchelev. Ah, it causes the heart to rejoice. Therefore, David HaMelech says, Mitzvat Hashem Bara. God created the Torah, the commandments, Me'irat Enaim. In order to enlighten our eyes, so that our eyes should be open to what? Mishpete Hashem Emet. To understand that the judgments, that the Torah of Hashem is Emet, is truth. God's words embedded in His Holy Torah, His statutes, His laws, and His judgments, because they are filled with emet, with truth, says David, are nechemadim mi zahav o mi pazrav. They should be desired more than any gold and fine jewels because there is nothing in the world that can bring you an inner calmness, a peace, and a happiness other than the truth of Torah. And if you adapt it, it's going to help you find the inner truth within you as well. And when you have truth as your guide, not fallacies, when truth is your path, not justifications or defenses, when truth propels you, not your version of the truth, but the real truth. האמת היחידה, לא מה שאנחנו אומרות, לא מה שאנחנו חושבות. Then there's a chance to break out of the vicious cycle and find happiness. להיות בשמחה. But that can only happen, David HaMelech says, when we confront and deal with the truth. Because look what he says at the end. שגיאות, מי יבין? Who understands errors? No one wants to confront the wrong they've done, or the horrible path they chose, or the negative approach they took, or the darkness they embraced. No one wants to face the shigiot, the blunders and the missteps. David says, Mi avin, mi avin. We don't even want to understand it, because we know we'd have to do something about it. But that's the only way out of darkness and into a world of light. So we ask Hashem for assistance. David HaMelech says, Mi nistarot nakeni. These two words are the key to everything. Hashem, please cleanse me of my hidden sins. What hidden sins? David HaMelech is saying, Please purify me of all those moments when I was hiding behind my misconceptions and contradictions. When I hid behind the untruths and I used others as scapegoats in my life because I couldn't deal with my own reality. Because I was in the dark and chose Shekir and cast aside Emet. David HaMelech is saying, help me recognize the truth so I can walk through the tunnel of Nisyonot and find myself on the other side as a happier and different person. A person filled with spiritual strengths and resilience. A person full of passion and love 
for your Torah and my fellow Jews with, with, with positive energies to share. I want to be a person who's filled only with the truth. And that truth will not only bring me the happiness I seek, it will bring me closer to you, Hashem, because your seal is emet. You, Hashem, are faithful to the truth. And if you're faithful to that truth, so must I be. So this time period of the nine days, these restrictive days, where we feel like we're in handcuffs and we're limited, these aren't days we're simply supposed to get over. No. These are days we're supposed to confront and work through because they lead to the days of introspection and healing. They lead to Chodesh Elul, the month of Ani le Dodi ve Dodi Li. We bring comfort to Hashem when we're genuinely working through this time period, when we're sincerely toiling in our minds and hearts and actively mending. We comfort Hashem when He sees us confronting our own truths by facing all the fallacies that we created inside of us. We give nechama to the Ribbono Shel Olam, notni nechama la Hashem, when he sees us seeking out the truth in all circumstances of life, not just in certain areas of it, or regarding only certain people. And as painful as that truth may be, it can heal and it can be of great comfort. So tonight, we're going to learn how we could provide Hashem with comfort through the recognition of some basic truths. Tonight, we're going to find meaning in these days of mourning because during these days of Av, we're not the only ones mourning. We're not the only ones in a state of sadness. Avinu Shabbashamayim says, as you sit in a state of mourning over the exile, over the life of the Jew in this door, in this generation, and all the challenges that you're facing, or how removed you really are from the truth, I too am mourning together with you. And I'm willing to come down from the heavens to sit on the floor together with you and hold your hand through this process of mourning. During these significant and intense days, Hashem is here with every single one of us, urging us to cast aside the falsehood and the fallacies and to embrace His truth. And when that truth hits us hard and we begin to feel it, to cry over it, mourn it, Hashem is there with us crying with us, hoping we'll reach out to him for guidance, for support, and for the answers. And we see that by virtue of our tefillah in shul this past Shabbat. Shabbat Mevarchim. Every Shabbat, kol Shabbat Mevarchim, we recite a special tefillah that ushers in the new month, Nachon Bilkat HaChodesh. In that tefillah, the Chazan announces the name of the month and the day that the new month will grace our calendar. 
But the month of Av is different. Chodesh Av u'acher legamre. Instead of announcing that this month will be Av, what did the Chazan say? Ma Chazan amar b'Shabbat mevarchim. He said, "Beyom Shishi Yihye Rosh Chodesh Menachem Av." Oh, this coming Friday will be the new month of the comfort of the Father. Oh, interesting, man. Yeah. He did not say, "Beyom Shishi Yihye Rosh Chodesh Av." He said, "Yihye Rosh Chodesh Menachem Av." Why is this month called Menachem Av? Lama lo sif? Menachem Av. And Chachamim teach us that there's an aspect here of Nichum Avelim, of comforting the mourner. Menachem Av. Lenachem Avelim. This is the month where a shiva call has to be made to the one who's sitting in mourning. Who's the one in a great state of avelut who's crying bitterly and in great pain? It's our Av. Abba, Abba Sheba Shamaim, our Father, Hashem. Gamu ba'avelut. God is in a state of avelut in this month more than any other month. Chachamim teaches that he's, he's in a great deal of pain and he's mourning the fact, you ready for this one? That we're not mourning enough. That there's so much we need to be accountable for. So much we need to address, so much we're dismissing, so much we're ignoring, so much we think we've dealt with, and we don't even realize the fallacy behind it all. As the world unravels all around us, with the greatest challenges befalling our people, Hashem mourns the fact that we're still in a state of slumber, not wanting to wake up and face the truth. We still live in our world of fallacies, conjuring up all kinds of justifications, while the exile, while the darkness broadens and expands and settles itself deeper into the psyche of our being. Hashem is mourning over all the things we are not mourning enough about, or at all, or at all. Hashem cries, Ktosh Baruch Hu Bokhe, and he says, Oy li, oy li, woe to me. My house is destroyed. A bite sheli, and bite. My people have lost their way. A yeladim sheli, bduta derech. Ve'emet, the truth, ve'emet, <coughs> it's nowhere to be found. Banai she'galu mishulchan avihem, woe to the children whom I had to banish from their father's table. I sent them into the galut as a form of therapy to confront their wrongdoings to embrace the truth and to cast aside the falsehood, I, 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 I wanted them to search their souls and genuinely yearn to return to their authentic selves, to the relationship we once had, to the truth of my Torah. And instead, they settled themselves in a place of falsehood within themselves and around them. They became comfortable there in that place. They decided that this place of shakir will be the safest and best place for them. Woe to me, Hashem says, Oi li ala banim for the children 
who have lost the emet. And now the only emet that could redeem them, they're afraid of. They cannot confront it. And they dismiss it. And when they dismiss the emet, they dismiss me because I am emet. Oh, Eli, for this great tragedy of Am Yisrael, for all these years that, that, that they were seeped in falsehood and that they cannot see past it and into the light. Chaval. Be'emet chaval. Hashem is in a state of avelut. He's mourning. So, so during these days, we try to provide comfort to Avinu Shabashamayim, who sits as a mourner together with us. Sadly, most of us, I think here, have paid a shiva call at one point or another in our lifetime to somebody that we knew, no? Yes? Okay, sadly. I say to them that I'm sure that in their lives, unfortunately, someone here had to be לנחם איזה אבל אחד, ללכת לשבעה. Try and remember that time. תנסי להיזכר. As you walk into the mourner's house, you're very quiet. You, you, you suddenly find yourself in a solemn state. You don't know what to say. You're hesitant to speak because you don't want to say the wrong thing. So do you know what most of us generally do? We drop our heads and we try to just empathize with the mourner. We show the mourner that I'm here with you in your state of sadness. I feel your pain. I want to help comfort and console you however you need. Kshad ba lebayt shel nichum avelim lo yadat ma lagid. פתאום את מוקפת בש, בשקט, את בעצמך שקטה, פתאום את מרגישה את הכבדות של השתיקה הזו, את גם לא יודעת מה להגיד. מה תגידי, יש מילים? אז מה עושים כרגיל? את פשוט מנסה להזדהות עם האבל. להראות לו שאת איתו לאורך כל הדרך. אני איתך, איתך, סארי. איתך, למענך, אני אעזור לכם, אל תדאגו, אתם לא לבד. And we begin to speak quietly and respectfully. When we enter a house of avelim, we don't hear music blaring in the background, do we? Do we? לא. We don't see people walking around with beers in their hands. We don't see people showing off what they just bought in the department store. And it's not because that's the halakha, but because that's just not the atmosphere for that. We're not engaging in celebratory meals and festivities, not just because of the halakha, because it's just not the atmosphere for such things. Hence the laws of the nine days. They're not just a bunch of restrictions. They're meant to set the tone of how you, you'd walk into the home of an Avel. You'd walk in quietly, and you would sit next to the mourner, identifying with his pain, empathizing and trying to feel with him. We would turn to Borei Olam. If Avel was Borei Olam, we would turn to him. And we would say to him, Ribbono shel olam, Ech nenachem otcha? How can we console you? What can we do to minimize your pain? How could we come for you during these days that maskir lecha, that remind you of the churban, the destruction that you had to bring about because of our sins? Your children are in the galut. And sadly, 
we've, we've remained here in this state and we know that causes you great sorrow. So how can we bring you some happiness? How can we comfort you? You know, in some Sephardic communities, yesh minhag etzel asfaradim, there's a minhag, that when a person sits in avelut, kshemishu yoshe be'avelut, it's not just the immediate family who joins him. Do you know that? Even the extended family participates. לא רק הקרובים יושבים איתו ו- ומתאבלים איתו, אלא גם אלו שקרובים אליו מרחוק. מה זה אומר? What does that mean? During the שלושים, during the first 30 days of mourning, all the extended family members will not like the mourner. They will not go to weddings or שמחות. לא ילכו. They will not listen to music. They won't purchase new items or engage in activities that provide them with pleasure. I remember I had once a very close friend whose mother passed away around Purim time. So Purim, I had no other choice. I had to give up Bishlochemanot, things like that. But I remember that whole Shloishim, she doesn't even know about it. I, I refrained from doing things that she did. She didn't listen to music, I didn't even listen to music. She didn't buy new things, then neither did I buy. So she doesn't know it, I didn't want to tell her to, to make her more sad, but you have to identify with that person's pain. And if anybody on the street would have come over to me and said, oh, you, you know, who did you lose, Chaz Shalom? I would say, there was a loss in our family of Am Yisrael. We lost somebody. So we have this minhag because when we do that, we, we, we show that we feel the avelut together with our friends. After all, there is a loss in the family. And when there's a loss, you have to feel the pain of the one who's mourning. You don't offer the mourner to go out for a drive or to go buy an ice cream cone, right? Let's go out for an ice cream cone, you'll feel better. Do you do that? You don't take someone who's mourning a great loss on a three-day vacation to get his mind off of things, do you? Do you? Lama la? Lama la? No. You know why? Because Chachamim tell us we want the mourner to feel the loss. We want him to feel it. It's the time now to feel it. And we want to feel it together with him. And when the mourner knows that his extended family, his friends, are mourning together with him, you know how he feels? How do you think he feels? Yeah? Comforted, cared for. Comforted, cared for. gives strength. It moves that person deeply to know that someone out there truly feels not just for him, with him. He feels that someone else is carrying the pain, not instead of him, together with him, and not trying to numb his pain with all kinds of external and frivolous activities. That person feels that someone else is going through the difficult time together with him, understanding him, but more than anything, that he's not alone. And that's what creates a very comforting feeling. And we want to create that feeling for the Ribbono Shel Olam during these days of Menachem Av, of Nichum Avelim. So perhaps through consoling God, we'll feel some comfort as well. Perhaps this Nachamu, Nachamu, 
this double consolation that takes place after Tisha B'Av, where really the, I feel the Nachamu, Nachamu is of us comforting Hashem, and then Hashem comforting us, that will bring about the Mashiach. There's a give and a take. Because in our tefillot we say, Our eyes want to see you, Hashem, returning to Yerushalayim with mercy. We would feel comforted knowing that our eyes finally saw the return of Hashem to Zion, to the place where Hashem calls home. Home is not the United States. Home is not Europe. Home is not South America. Home is not South Africa. Eretz Yisrael is a bayit shel arivono shel olam. By the way, I just read uh, a medrash that says that there's nowhere in the world where Hashem's shechina rests. Rakpo. The shechina can't be anywhere else but in Eretz Yisrael. But we want Hashem to come home. Nachon? We want the Abba to come home. We want to be reunited with Him because Without him, bli Hashem, without his truth, bli emet shelo, we are simply lost. <coughs> we want our eyes to behold the splendor of Yerushalayim and the building of the Bet HaMikdash. V'techezena einenu b'shuv chaletzion berachamim. I was just at the Kotel the other day, and when you approach the Kotel, how excited do you get? How, how emotional do you get? And that's just one wall. And even that one wall is not even the whole wall, because they kept building on top of the, right, of the pavements for years, for thousands of years. And that's one wall. Can you imagine the whole edifice? Where we tell Hashem, Please, Hashem, let these words bring you great comfort. We want to console you. We want you to come home to us. We want the conflict, the exile, the darkness, and the sheker to come to an end already. We want to experience together with you the truth, the glory, and the grandeur of your malchut. The question is, the question is, do we really want to put an end to the fallacies, to the darkness, and the tragedies of this galut? השאלה היא, אנחנו אומרים לריבונו של עולם, המילים האלו שאנחנו אומרים לך, ותחזנה עינינו בשוב לך לציון, אמור לתת לך נחמה, שאנחנו רוצים לראות אותך, להרגיש אותך, קרוב אלינו. אבל השאלה היא, האם אנחנו באמת רוצים לשים סוף לגלות הזו? לכל הטרגדיות וכל החושך וכל השקר? האם זה באמת שאנחנו רוצים סוף לדבר? Do we really want this all to come to an end? מה, באמת אנחנו רוצים לשים סוף לזה? מה את אומרת? Oh, yeah. uh, you, you, את אומרת ודאי, the other one says yes, for sure. I say, I don't know. I don't know. אני לא יודעת. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. It's not just me. I'm going to give you now words from the Chachamim, not me. Mishu Pam visited the Chafetz Chaim, Alav Shalom, in his home, Babayit Shalom. And he, he, what did he see? Ma ora'a, shulchan katan, a little table, a chair. Ma'zeh chair? 
לא, the chair is כיסא. <laughs> It's okay, את רואה, את לומדת slowly, slowly. הוא ראה שולחן, כיסא, אין אין אייסבאק, זה קופסה קטנה כמו פריג'ידר קטן, אבל זה מקפיא. A table, a chair, and an ice box. And in the adjoining room he saw איזה מזרון כזה שכאילו, like a mattress, כאילו מיטה, like a bed. עכשיו, this man, who knew, ידעה, that the חפץ חיים is considered one of the גדולי הדור. Turn to him, and he said, "Kvod Arav, where is all your furniture? If a kol atziut shalcha, if a kol areut, where's the rest of your house? I see a table, I see a chair, I see what looks like an old mattress there somewhere in the adjoining room. But where's the rest of your furniture? What do you live on?" The chafetz chaim chayech. He smiled and he says to him. Where's your furniture? So the man says, Rabbi, you, don't, you can't compare. Ani achshav, ani be traveling. How do you say traveling in Hebrew? I forgot. Ani benesia, ani benesia ben. I'm only passing through your town. Rak avarti derecha ir shelcha. This is not my home. Zelo abayit sheli po. I'm far from home, אני רחוק מהבית, so I don't need to have furniture, אין לי צורך לרעות, זה לא הבית שלי. החפץ חיים חייך עוד יותר. החפץ חיים smiled even more and he says, I'm also far from home. I'm also only passing through. And this is not where I really belong. הבנתם? דחפץ חיים's message pierces our heart and, and, and begs the question of how did we lose our sensitivity? How did we lose our direction? How did the fallacy of galut suddenly become our truth? This is what causes Hashem to mourn and to cry. Sadly, because we keep repeating the offenses of the past, the galut lingers, and we've been trapped in the galut for so many years, and אנחנו כאן בגלות כל כך המון שנים, we've become desensitized from the truth. האמת כבר לא משפיעה. The Shlach Kadosh Alav HaShalom commented, these are his words, you're not going to believe what he said now, I'm translating them to you in, in English, to English. He commented, קשה, קשה to read these words, but we talk about, we spoke about truth, right? The truth hurts, truth hurts. האמת פוגעת לפעמים. But there's no way out, than, out of this galut other than the truth. The Shlach Kadosh commented like this, that if we really believed, באמת היינו מאמינים, that Mashiach is coming, and certainly, and he's talking about those days, and certainly these days, And I say the same thing, with everything that's happening in the world, his footsteps are louder than they've ever been. At Margisha ve'at shomat et ha'ikvetad ha'meshicha, says the Shlach HaKadosh, if we really believe that the end is drawing near, in b'met ha'inu ma'aminot sh'asof megiya, and that Mashiach's arrival is imminent, sh'bechol rega Mashiach megiya, If we really wanted Hashem to end this miserable galut that came at such a high price, אם באמת היינו רוצות שהקדוש ברוך הוא כבר ישים סוף לגלות המטורפת הזו, שזה הגיע במחיר מאוד עצום, If we really wanted him to return to Zion, I'm quoting his words. would we be investing in and renovating the big homes we're purchasing in the Galut? האם היינו משקיעים ומשפצים את הבתים הגדולים שקנינו בגלות? That goes on the heels of the story of the Chafetz Chaim, right? Would we be placing ads in the paper 
That's, he's not saying, I'm saying that now. For people to purchase homes in the Galut, to build shuls in Gentile areas so we could be pioneers, just to make it comfortable for us to remain in the Galut? Would we promote or start new businesses in the Galut? Asks the Shlach Kadosh. Aim ainu mashkiim bekol minei businesses be Galut? That's something the Shlach Kadosh wonders. He wonders, do we really mean the words we speak when our actions defy those words? Where once again our fallacies are getting in the way of the truth. We recite such comforting words to Hashem. But do these words match our reality? We order the words, What do we say before? We tell Hashem, you, Hashem, in your great mercy, we want you to desire us. We want you to want us. We want to see you again come back. We want to see you finally returning to Yerushalayim. We're waiting and we're longing to see that day. We want you to come home, Hashem, come home. And to prove it to you, before we could even finish the rest of the sentence, Hashem says, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I hear your beautiful words. But show me that you really mean what you just uttered. You really want me to come home? Do you really? Because I see you settling yourselves in the galut. I see you reinventing yourself in the galut. I see you promoting your businesses in the Galut. I see you becoming pioneers in Gentile areas of the Galut, happy to be living there, even supposedly building shuls in these places that are filled with the Tumah of the Goim, all for the sake of settling yourselves there, all for the sakes of you having a nice home and a scenic background. I see you raising children in the Galut, knowing that they're losing their Jewish identity there, there, and then you use your children as an excuse not to leave the Galut. Oh, I have children, I have grandchildren, I hear that if I come with my children to Eretz Yisrael, they'll get lost, they'll lose their way. Then you use them as an excuse. I see you encouraging people to remain in the Galut and not to take a chance to live in my holy land. I see you postponing and delaying your aliyah with all kinds of unjustifiable excuses and once again using others as scapegoats, as an escape from your spiritual responsibilities. I see you renovating your homes in the Galut. I see you planting roots in the Galut. And then you tell me, you really want me to come home. You see the, un the fallacies here? The, the, uh, are you hopping the fallacy here? Sarah, you hop what I'm talking So these days of the nine days are indeed days of brokenheartedness. Mamash lev shavur of the fallacies and contradictions of Am Yisrael. Indeed, these are the days when truth has to lead the way. The truth behind those fallacies and correction of the contradictions. If our longing and yearning is sincere, if at least, you know, during these appropriate days of mourning, we could try, just try to be honest enough with ourselves and reach deep within to retrieve the truth, 
maybe we would realize why it is the entire world is in one big state of mourning. You realize the world is slowly dying, right? Nachon? Kol ha'olam olech lamut. Uchanit, ken? Right? The world is slowly wilting away. And maybe if we would think about it, it would prompt us maybe to yearn for the right things and to, to, to long for a, a, a genuine redemption. Maybe at least during these nine days we should try to empower ourselves with the truth of our state of affairs. And then it'll be easier to comfort Hashem and even ourselves through this mourning period. That's what these nine days stand for. It's the feeling that's conjured up as a result of the truth that we have to confront. And if we're not going to feel that truth, not even in these nine days, if we don't feel the truth of our lives, even in the days of the day, you know what these days turn into? Do you know what these days turn into? They turn into simply days of restrictions with all kinds of isurim and the things we're not allowed to engage in. They become days we simply can't wait to be over and done with so that we can continue the masquerade of life with all the things we think provide us with happiness, safety, and comfort when in reality all those things are merely external husks. They're like klipot. They're the things that are blocking you from feeling and responding to the reality of life that you're meant to respond to from a place of truth. You hear what I... These days when not dealt with properly, they, they simply turn into days where you feel that handcuffs were placed on your wrists and you're just counting down the days until they'll be removed so you could go back to what? To the, to, to, to the, to the simha, supposedly. But you haven't accepted the reasons why the handcuffs are there in the first place. יש אזיקים בימים האלה. לא יכולים לעשות את זה, לא יכולים לעשות את זה. אם אנחנו לא נטפל באמת של הימים האלו, אנחנו לא נבין שיש סיבה שיש אזיקים על הידיים שלך. It means you haven't contemplated the confinement or considered the consequences. It's all about trying to access a get out of jail free card as quickly as possible when the Yeshua is calling out to you during this time. A Yeshua Bemet Koretlach Bayamimaelo. So within the, the, the framework of these intense days, there's beauty and there's redemption to be found. Amid these days of sadness, there's happiness that can surface. In the midst of, of these days of mourning, there's hope and renewal that can sprout forth and create a new life, new beginnings, a new path of truth that could result in an inner Yeshua, Yeshua Pnimit, Vegam, global Geula. These are the days where we could cry out to connect to the truth of our Father who our souls long to see again. The Dubna Magid, Allah wa Shalom, comments on the words, V'techezena einenu b'shuvcha letzion berachamim. And he provides us with a powerful and very harsh mashal. Dubna Magid, noten lanu, על המילים, ותחזנה עינינו בשובך לציון ברחמים, משל מאוד חזק, אבל הוא קשה. He says, there was a king, it always starts like that, right? There was once a king, 
But guess what? There's no prince in this. <laughs> in this mashal, there's no prince. There was a king whose subjects were not so crazy about him. As a melech she'avadim shelo, lo kol kach el, lo avu ato kol kach. Even the army, whose task it was to defend the king, didn't think that the monarch was worthy. One day, the king's realm was attacked by a neighboring king and his army. Now, being that the subjects of the current kingdom didn't really like the king that much, they did not rally to his side or fight to defend him. אני אומרת שאפילו הצבא לא אהבה אותו כל כך הרבה. יום אחד איזה מלך מעיירה אחרת הגיע עם כל הצבא שלו, התחיל להתקיף את כל המלכות. ובגלל שהעבדים של המלך הזה בכלל לא אהבו אותו, אז לא נלחמו בעדו. And when the army, וכשהצבא שלו גם saw the citizens of the realm are not defending their own king, they too stood down and the king was left exposed and vulnerable to the enemy. It took only one day, for the enemy to come along and destroy what the king had built and for the enemy to take over the kingdom. The Oyev, the enemy, together with the soldiers, threw the king out and exiled him. And then they took over his country and all the lands that he had amassed. And now this kingdom had a new king and new inhabitants who came from the other side. And at first the citizens were very happy. עיירה חדשה עם אנשים חדשים שנכנסו, והם היו כל כך שמחים. Finally, they didn't have to deal with the king anymore. סוף סוף, לא צריכים לטפ... להתייחס אליו ולא... They can now feel freer, happier, safer, and better without him there. בלי שהוא שם? שמחה יותר, כיף לי יותר. But what the subjects of that realm didn't realize is that the new king and his entourage were not trustworthy and they had their own interests and agendas. It took a very long time, took a very long time, but eventually, sof sof, they discovered that the new king and their new way of life was worse than what they had before. The new king tripled their taxes. He plotted behind their backs. He smiled in their direction and told them nice words. But behind their backs, he was speaking ill of them and plotting. He made them work harder than they did, be <coughs> than they did before. Eventually, they saw his true face and they realized that the new king was a monster. He wasn't really there for their benefit. He was there for his own self-interests. And it took a long time, like I said, but ultimately they began to feel the pain. And when things became even more complex than before, when they faced even more difficult challenges, they realized that the new administration, the new regime, was worse than what they previously experienced. And when they finally woke up, sof sof amitoreru, and they accepted that hard truth, it suddenly placed their former king in a different light. They realized that the other king was not so bad after all. He was a lot kinder, a 
a lot more sensitive, יותר רגיש, more compassionate, יותר רחמן, יותר אוהב, יותר מבין. He actually helped them. הם הבינו שהוא באמת עזר להם. They just didn't have the right eyes. פשוט לא היה להם את העין הטובה to see him for who and what he truly was. And they began to cry. מה זה? התחילו? יפה. And mourn the reality, hoping and praying that somehow the king would return. רק שיחזור, רוצים אותו חזרה. They all wondered, איפה הוא? איפה הוא? Where he was? They forgot that they helped excommunicate him and threw him out of the realm. They forgot about that. But they wondered, where could he be? Where could he be? Where did he go? Do we know where he was exiled to? So, one old and wise man, he was a good friend of the king, I know where he is. He's hiding in a cave in the mountains. I'll go there and approach him on your behalf. I'll tell him and he'll give him that his people are longing to see him and they're just waiting to see him that they're sorry for their appalling behavior and they're just waiting for their appalling behavior and their cruel betrayal and that they're just waiting for him in such a way so and cruel how do you say cruel? Achzari, yafe and that they want him to come home I'll tell them, tell them that. I'll tell them he should come back and reclaim what is his. His lands, his properties, his palace, his people. I'll make the trip and I'll bring him back. The wise man made his way up to the mountains and he found the cave, Matzata Me'ara, where he saw his friend, the king, sitting on the floor, wrapped in shrouds, atuf betachrichim. He was no longer wearing a crown on his head. Gvar keter ala rosh lo ayalo. And the genuine and happy smile he once wore on his face had vanished. Gvar lo ala chiyuch ala panim. He saw the king sitting there and crying. He, he put his arms around him and he says, Your majesty, please don't cry. Your people regret their terrible actions against you. They're sorry for all the pain they caused you and how they betrayed you and allowed the enemy to exile you. They realize their grave error and they long to just see you again. They want you to come back and rec reclaim the throne that you once occupied, the place that belongs only to you. They love you. The king looked up and he said, what? They told you they want me to come back. They told you they regret the error of their ways and their behavior. They said they wish they could see me again and that they love me. They're lying to you. That's not the emet. It's a sheker. They're the ones who gave me up. They're the ones who in one day tossed me aside and allowed strangers to take over the kingdom. They're the ones who stood on the sidelines and watched the enemy get rid of me. They didn't even stand up for me. They didn't fight for me. They were more excited about what the new king had to offer them than what I had provided them with. They decided I'm not good for them. So they did away with me in the most despicable fashion and they never looked back. They practically rolled out the red carpet to the new regime and placed their trust and hopes in the new king and all his soldiers. They allowed strangers to march right into the place that I called home, to the place I occupied, 
and they helped those strangers take away everything that I helped build and then they threw me out. These are the people who claim they're sorry and they want to see me again. It's a lie. It's a sheker echad gadol. And really not surprising, it's gam lo kol kach marashim, you know, because they've been living a life for many years and gvar chayim b'sheker amon shanim. They should have realized the real reason behind their own pain and suffering. Zeh shem savlu kol hashanim, zeh lo haya biglali. They should have come to the truth and recognition that all those bad feelings, all the negativity that they felt and all the troubles they claimed to have wasn't about me. It was because of the bad decisions they were making in their life. And because of the truths they were not willing to face. So they constructed a fallacy in their mind of what a happy, safe, and better place looks like. And they decided that if they replace me with another king, with another administration, they will have a happier existence. They don't really want to see me again. They just once again want a way out of the current troubles they find themselves in. You're happy with the mashal is, right? I don't have to. No, there's no name shal over him. <laughs> so the wise man said, Your Majesty, at the time that they betrayed you, they didn't have the ability to appreciate you or see you in a positive light. Sadly, they saw you as a thorn in their side that if removed, the pain will subside. But now they realize how mistaken they were. Not only didn't the pain go away, it intensified. The new king and his regime recreated even more difficulties their lives have become more strained and complex. They're begging you, please reclaim the throne and come back to the place you belong, the place you once occupied. And the king said, I don't know. Tell me, how can I believe you? And the wise man said, I have a way to prove it to you. My dear king, I want you to dress up like a commoner. Then you and I will walk through the streets of the city among the people and you'll hear their sighs and their sadness You'll hear them crying and saying at the Omrim, where is our old king? We miss our king. And when you'll hear them speaking the truth from their heart, it will convince you, and it will give you the incentive to return to your place. And when they hear that you're willing to return, they might finally get up and fight for you. So the king agreed to the plan. He dressed up as a commoner, and together with the wise men, he traveled to the countryside and he walked to the streets and all the familiar places he once strolled through when he was a king. Suddenly, he heard <laughs> cheering, <laughs> applause. He turned around and he saw a big stadium 
where a soccer game was taking place at Stadion Shel Kadu Regen. 30,000 איש, רואה 30,000 people on their feet, על הרגליים שלהם, laughing, צוחקים, screaming, צועקים, looking like they're having the time of their life. בירות בידיים, they had beers in their hands, popcorn, popcorn, they're having a blast. So the king turns to his friend and he says, these people aren't crying out for anything or anyone. הם לא זועקים וצועקים לא לאף אחד ולא לאף דבר. They seem to be having a wonderful time. These people don't miss me. They look like they're not missing anything. לא חסר להם שום דבר. So the wise man, הוא בעצמו היה בשוק, he himself is in shock, couldn't believe this. So he tells the king, you know what? Don't look at these people. אתה יודע, אל תתייחס אליהם. I'll show you other people. Let's go. <coughs> so now they walk to the other side of the city where they found many restaurants bursting at the seam with people. The king walked into the restaurant. He sees the people dining on the finest steaks, delicious desserts, wine. They were content. They were laughing, laughing and giggling with one another. And it seemed as if they didn't have a care in the world. So the king turned to the wise man and he said, look at these people. They seem to be having a wonderful time too. They're not missing me. They don't care about my absence. And this went on the entire time. Everywhere the wise man took the king, the king saw the people having a grand time. Party. Simcha. Seemingly happy. Distracting themselves with all kinds of superficialities, restaurants, theme parks of all kinds, outings, vacations, barbecues, parties. But he also saw that their life was status quo. Nothing was really moving in any real, significant or truly positive direction. And sadly, many of them thought that they were really happy and content. And most of them acted as if they didn't have a care in the world, nor were they contemplating the king's return. So the wise man said, My dear king, I know this is very disheartening, and I'm so sorry. But please allow me to take you to one more place. I want to take you back to your palace. I know that it sits in ruins because it was destroyed. But I want to take you back nonetheless. Because I want you to see how there are still some loyal and devoted people. אני רוצה שתראה במו עיניך שיש עדיין אנשים אמינים who go there, שהולכים לשם just to feel your presence, רק כדי להרגיש את הנוכחות שלך. And these loyal and loving people, אלו האנשים, they are the ones who cry out for you, הם אלה שבאמת צועקים וזועקים שתחזור, they are the ones who yearn to see you, they are the ones who say, where is our old king? We miss him. We yearn to see him again. Ulai, perhaps when you see them, you'll finally be convinced. Sof, sof, The king agreed, and they walked back to the palace. And there, the king saw how the only thing left of his beautiful home was one lone and singular wall. 
רואה שמה שנשאר מכל הארמון זה פשוט קיר אחד שם שעומד. The king was overwhelmed with emotions. And he began to cry. He remembered, זכר, how here in this one spot, פה, במקום הזה, stood a beautiful and magnificent palace. He remembered his chambers, his throne room, and all the people who once came to discuss matters of importance with him. And as the king approached his old home, he noticed many people standing near this lone wall, Salmim, taking pictures, pointing the wall out to their children, they were tourists, tourists, who saw this site as an old relic of the past. They stood there, Amdusham, taking pictures of this ancient landmark, planning to post it on their statuses so everyone can see where they were in the world. I was here at the ancient wall. And the king couldn't believe what he saw. I don't mean to add it. Azu turns to his friend and he says, "That's what they did with my palace, Zema Shasui Malmonshali. They turned it into a tourist attraction. Afchol zeliot makom shel touristim. They're taking pictures and posting it on their statuses. That's what my palace has turned into. Mazan Sham Malmon." The king couldn't handle it. He lo yachal izbol et zayoter. He the the double magid calls it. I was didn't want to translate it, but I have to translate. He was repulsed by the sight, and he turns to the wise man and he says, "That's it. I've seen enough. Right, he must speak. I've heard enough. I'm going back to the meara. I'm going back to the cave, and that's where I will remain. V'sham ani shayra." But then, as Pitom, from the corner of his eye, he suddenly saw one man, was it Ben Adam Echad, sitting on the floor against the lone wall, the only remnant of the king's palace. Ureshe, his shoes were off, and he was sitting there, Yosef Sham, weeping, boche. The king comes closer to the man and he hears the man saying, Oh, Ilano, woe to us. Where is our king? Where is his home? How is the king really feeling? This land was once so beautiful, yet we allowed others who didn't have any appreciation of it Destroy it. Oh, Ilano, what have we done? Masinu, Masinu. The king looked at this one man. And he thought, You're crying over me? You're shedding tears over what happened to me? To you? To us and this glorious kingdom? You're the only one who's really crying over me. Ata yachid, she boche alai, that is thinking about me, she choshev alai, and you're showing it. Vashet bemet mar'e. Chayecha, by your life, I give you my word, and I notan lecha tamila sheli, that because of you, I will come back. And when I come back, do you know what I am going to do for you? Do you know what I'm going to do for you? Do you know what I'm going to do for you? You just consoled me. You, you just brought some relief and happiness back into my heart. And when I come back, I'm going to console you. And I'm going to you. And bring you genuine happiness. When I come back, I'm not going to forget you. 
I'm not going to forget this moment, אני לא אשכח את הרגע הזה. I'm going to elevate you, אני, אני יעלה אותך מעלה מעלה to the most worthy position in my kingdom. Says the Dubna Magid. The king is Bore Olam. And he passes through this world during these nine days of Av in search of someone out there who cares enough to cry about him and the sad state of this Galut. He's in search of someone who recognizes the truth and the reality of this Galut. Hashem is looking for someone who will comfort him and who will feel his pain, not just his own. If any one of us could reach deep within to retrieve the truth so the recognition and awareness is brought to light, surely we'd want to comfort Hashem and do whatever we could to alleviate his pain. וכשהריבונו של עולם רואה את זה, שאת מנחמת אותו ככה, when Hashem sees this, Hashem says, I will never forget you. I will never forget this moment. The moment when you did not turn your back on the truth. לא נתת לי, לא נתת את הגב לאמת. You faced it. You brought it out to the surface. You took a good look at your reality and the state of Am Yisrael. And then, you began to lament, to have remorse, to correct, to mend, and to reach out to me in an attempt not only to repent, but to comfort me. I commend you, and I will never forget you. These days are the opportunity for closeness with Hashem. God is crying over the major losses in Am Yisrael. And He wants us to remember Him because He's in a great deal of pain. Hashem wants us to remember what these days represented and what their significance was and is. He wants to see his children feeling his pain. And when we take these days seriously, when we don't find a way out of the discomfort, but we allow that discomfort to lead us through the pain so that we could access a world of introspection, that leads us to the truth. And hopefully, that truth will lead us on a path of genuine charata, genuine remorse, tshuva, repentance, and tikkun, rectification. By recognizing the truth of how this galut be'emet affected us, echa galut be'emet ishpia alayich, by identifying the pain we ourselves created in Hashem, in ourselves, in others, we can then become the extended family members and use this time, this time of Nichum Avelim, to mourn together with Hashem. During these days of destruction, of the time period of a Churban, we have to feel the devastation. And when Hashem sees that we use this time appropriately, that we not only identified with his pain, but shared in his pain by refraining from activities that would otherwise create an escape route from the reality that we need to face. You understood that whole, whole long, long run-on sentence? When we actually work through these nine days by identifying, recognizing, embracing the truth by admission, feeling the remorse, repenting and correcting whatever wrongs we may have done, 
Then Hashem says, wow, wow, you didn't escape these days of intense introspection and mourning. You didn't run away from them. You confronted them. <coughs> you attempted to correct them and more. You felt them as an extension of yourself and you were able to console me. When the time will come for the final geula and for me to return to Zion, Berachamim, I will not forget you and my Rachamim will be upon you. In closing, ladies, when we long for Hashem, we're longing for the truth. And a person who longs for the truth needs to surround himself with truth. Hashem's truth is Torah. This Torah that we learn every two weeks, the truth embedded within it is going to help you confront the untruths. It will help you be more aware and more conscious in your life. It will make you a stronger and more resilient person who faces things and doesn't just run away from them. I'm going to turn you into a person who doesn't close the door on the truth and lock it because Hashem's truth is to confront difficulties, to confront challenges. And that truth will help you through the darkness of fallacies and bring you into a world of light. And that light is what's going to brighten your day and calm your soul. That light will shine the way towards a true place of simcha because you will be doing what Hashem wants you to be doing. You're attaching yourself to the truth. Attaching yourself to emet makes one happy. So if during this time period of Av, you are memaetet basimcha, if you minimize the escape routes of happiness, and you start working towards happiness, if you allow the discomfort to walk you through this tunnel of truth, then the minimization of simcha, which is the path towards real truth and recognition, will lead you to the greatest light that will shine from, forth from within you. And that light, the light of emet, the light of Torah, the light of Hashem, that light is what's going to create a correction for you and happiness in your life. It's going to redeem you. It's going to set you free from the shackles of the fallacies that you placed upon yourself. That's why if you notice, that's why if you notice, what does gola mean? What is gola? Galut. Gola za galut. Galut, exile. What is this? Geula. What's geula? Redemption. Well, I have a question for you. How can exile and redemption lie in the same word when they're the total opposites of one another? How can it be that gola and geula are the same word and the same word of one another? How's that possible? What's the one letter, Yeshrak Otachat, that makes all the difference, Ben, between being in a state of Gola and being in a state of Geula? What's the letter? Oh. Aleph. Oh, Yafe. Aleph is Emet. Truth. Aleph is also Alufo Shel Olam. Torah Shel Yachat, Torah, Hashem, and the Torah is one, it's a chad. Aval yoter mize. In the Aleph, hidden in the Aleph, are actually three letters. Yesh shlosha otiyot betoch ha'alef. There's two yuds, says the Maharal, shte yuds, yud, yud, and a vav. Chon, you see that? Yud, yud, and a vav. A yud, a yud, and a vav is how much? Kama begim matriya? 26. Oh, 
oh, oh, and 26, 26 is the numerical value of Hashem's name of Rachamim, right? Yud, K, a hey, a vav, and a hey is 26, 26, oh, oh. So do you know what separates us from redemption, both personal and global? The emet, I emet. When we'll be able to face the truths, work through them, and not around them. Lo misavim ha'emet. Lo, ze chetzi emet. Lo 99% emet. Lana 99% emet. By the way, the Khatam Sofer says, 99% truth means it's a lie. אמרתי לך כמעט את כל האמת, 99, אמרתי לך 99 אחוז, החתם סופר אמר, אם אמרת 99 אחוז מהאמת, and you left out 1%, את שיקרת. Because truth has to be 100%, it cannot be even, it cannot be 99. Anyway, when we'll be able to face the truths and, and work through them, not around them, לא מסביב האמת. One will truly repent. One will live, by this truth and do away with all the fallacies. When Torah Hashem, which is Hashem's seal of emet, will be our guide, then we'll be zeichet to see Hashem returning to Tzion Berachamim. But I just wanted to point something out that just struck me. You see this Lamid here? This is a very significant letter because the way the Lamed is shaped is that it starts at the root of the Adama and then it ascends towards where? Klape Mala, Klape Shamayim. Because the Lamed stands for Limud, the Limud of the Torah. And that Limud takes you from being here on earth and extends you to where? Brings you to higher realms. So part of Geula has to be a met velimud. You have to put the two. In order, meaning, in order to retrieve the truth, you need to learn. You have to you have limud. If you take away the aleph and the lamid, or actually, if you take away the lamid. Don't take away the olive. Take away just the lamid. I don't want to learn. I know it already. I know what Hashem expects of me. I know what Hashem wants. And you're there, call. Take away the lamid here. Yesh geula? Is there geula? No. What's left? Gava. A gava is what tells you I don't need to learn. I don't need to come to shiurim. I don't need to. I don't need. I don't need. En tzorich l'shiurim bishvil ma. אז אם את, אם את מוציאה את הלמד, את אומרת, אני צריכה ל, ללמוד. אני מספיק יודעת, מה זה מצחיק משיעורים כל פעם, אז מה, ממה זה בא? מהגאווה. ג' א' ו' ה'. הבנתם? So, לימוד, this is why you're here every two weeks. To learn about Hashem's truth, so that you can access that truth, and work through all of the psychology. And then, the Torah Tashem, which is Tamima, will be Be'emet Meshivat Nafesh. It will then help restore your spirit. It's going to show us what real happiness looks like. And more. We'll have earned, we will have earned happiness. It's not a push of a button, you have to earn it. We will have finally realized that happiness is not closing your eyes and choosing to be happy. We will have understood that happiness was not a choice. It was, it was a state of action and activation. The action, first and foremost, of what you're doing right now. Learning Hashem's Torah and connecting yourself to the emet. That's one. The activation of introspection when you're here. Using your mind to, to make truthful conclusions across the board. It's the actions of remorse, the act of repentance, the, the activation of rectification, which also happens here because your, your mind is thinking and working when you, you leave. Maybe I can fix, maybe I can do, maybe I can. So the Torah 
Hashem's truth and all the lessons embedded within that truth is what will provide us with the happiness that we seek and the redemption we long for. Yiratzon, that these intense days of the minimization of happiness will make us realize how we could really attain it. May we come to a place of inner truth that spans across our life and not just specific people or occurrences. May we be worthy of experiencing the emet, living with the emet, and always using the emet as a place of reference in our life. May we be zeichet to comfort Hashem with the emet, lenachem oto ima emet, as awful as that truth may be. But at least he sees that we're seeking it. Trying to work through it, achieve it, and maybe even correct the fallacies that have blinded us from the Amet. May we embrace Hashem in his hour of need and pain as he confronts the truth of our Churban and together with him create a union that's founded on Amet and founded on Bitachon, hence the month of Av. Aleph is Emet, and Bet is Bitachon. May the truth lead us to a better and safer place within ourselves. May it reveal all the things necessary for us to finally come out of the darkness so that we could step into the light. And may that light shine brightly in our life and in our hearts as we begin to feel what real happiness is. And then we'll be zaycheh to witness the pasuk coming to life. V'techezena einenu b'shuv chaletzion b'rachamim. Amen ken yehi ratzon. Question. Yeah. <laughs> Since um, Tisha B'Av is actually on Shabbos, and then it's... It's nidcha, right. So is it, I feel like Hashem is... It could be either way that he wants us to have some nach, some uh, nachama. nachama before mm -hmm. we go into it, or <coughs> that he's that he's pushed it off and he doesn't want to come. Um, there are many ways that you could look at it. It's a very good question. Sarah, come back before you go to Brooklyn. Um, so actually, Chachamim say, I just read it in one of the Sfarim the other day, I was, while I was studying to go over the shiur, that some Chachamim say the greatest Shabbat on the calendar, I was shocked when I read it, the greatest Shabbat, the holiest Shabbat on the calendar, it's the Shabbat that HaKadosh Baruch Hu put Tisha B'Av on Shabbat. Why? Because it's not supposed to be there. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu is kind of comforting the people and saying, this is the time now because it's Shabbat. Shabbat is letter, the letters of Tshuva. Shabbat is Tshuva. I'm putting Tisha B'Av now as a Nitche because really I don't want you to be fasting. I really would love it if there was a Geula and if you could make that happen. So now this Shabbat, Hashem is saying, why don't you connect to me because this is the time to connect to me. This is the time where you and I could be one. This is the time where all the rectifications can take place and maybe we won't even have, you won't even have to fast tomorrow. So I actually read that the greatest and holiest day is Be'emet when Tisha Be'av falls out on a Shabbat because that is the, the best time to connect to the Yobano Shel Olam during this intense time of Chorban. You know where you're actually crying, to, well, you shouldn't cry on the Shabbat, but where you actually tell them, I do realize that there was a Chorban here. I'm not, I'm not, and I'm not just talking about the Bet HaMikdash. The Chorban of Am Yisrael, there's a Chorban taking place here. So many people are lost, so many people went off the derech, so many people even that are on the derech are not making the proper decisions. Even within our own people, there's the churban gadol. And that's part of the truth that we have to sit with ourselves. So Shabbat is usually a time where you can focus more. You're more attentive to Hashem's needs and to the needs of Klal Yisrael. Because you're not busy with all the other things that distract you. Hence, 
Tisha B'Av falling out on Shabbat is actually the holiest day of the year. Because it's the time that you can actually bring the Geulah on that day. Meaning, Motzei would be because Mashiach can't come on the Shabbat. Any, anyone else? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, what is your name? Eileen Esther. Eileen Esther. Eileen Esther. Yeah. Yes, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that at one point, maybe people were thinking it's not a good idea that he come, that, that you know, Mashiach or whatever. So I Mashiach? Know, what that about? No, no, like the king. The in, the, in the Mashal, the in the Mashal, the Dubna Mag, it says that at some, some people, meaning some people really wanted the king to come back, even though they themselves were in a... Were in a when you asked us about Mashiach, if you were to come right away, you said that you yourself... Ah, you you're yourself. talking about me? Why I said, I said, I don't, I said, I don't know. Right. For the reason that the Dubar Magid says, I don't know. For the reason that the whole Mashal, because for the reason that I said everything that I said about, I have friends, uh, you know, in America that are not making their plans to come and they're actually building businesses over there and, and investing in homes over there. And I'm like, what are you in? I mean, like, hello. What is this? So, yes, that's I say, I don't know. I don't know if. You know, like a person could say, I want to, but. Chachamim say, when a person says the word, but, you can erase everything that came before that. The word aval should never be in your lexicon because it's just another word that excuses your fallacy. Chutz from one time that it was said in the entire Torah, and that's when the, when the brothers approached uh, Yosef HaTzadik and they finally um, they realized that everything that was happening to them was probably for something that they did to Yosef so there they used the word Aval we are, we are so guilty we are, we, but we are guilty so all the Chachamim jump on this oh what happened here they're saying Aval oh so you have to hear my shiur on that because that Aval was not a regular Aval it's not but uh, you know but we did this to him and we did that but, but, but we had good reasons and if, if, uh, if you guys were in the same position you would have also dumped him in the pit you would have also thrown him in it wasn't that kind of but it was a, a remorseful, it was a but of, but all this is happening now because of what we did. It was a, a, a sign of truthful recognition, which is what we spoke about today, understanding and recognizing the truth. So yeah, my, I have a big question about whether or not uh, we really, our actions and our words go hand in hand. And, and that's what the shield was about. You can only get back to that position through emet. The truth is what prompts a person to do the, the, the um, appropriate tshuva. Well, why would you do tshuva if unless you're not confronting the truths, right? Also, yisurim, bring the person back. All the yisurim. Yisurim, right. But Hashem, Chachamim say Hashem would prefer, would prefer if you didn't access him, cry out to him or repent due to the Yisurim. It shouldn't take a tragedy in your life or a terrible circumstance in order for you to, to be close to him, to connect yourself to him and to heed his words. It's not ideal, but it's what's happening. It's what's happening, because yes. We're not, because we're not doing it the other way. Correct, we're not doing it the other way. And sadly, when a person, many people that when they experience Yisurim, they don't want to do the cheshbonot anefesh. They'll blame it on every other thing, on nature, you know, teva, you know, these things that are happening naturally, would happen to anyone else in our circumstance, either teva or they won't access the right ep like episode in their life that brought this about because they don't want to deal with it. Um, or in the worst case scenario, they'll actually pin it on Hashem. That's what I said. They, they'll use a scapegoat. So Hashem Piton became their scapegoat. They dump everything on Hashem and what did they t tell him? Why would you do this? Hashem, you're supposed to be Kel Rahman. You're supposed to be a merciful God. You're supposed to be a good God and you did this to me? 
one of the one of the fathers of uh, I don't remember which one it was uh, one of the boys who were killed in Miron. Um, so he said that someone asked him, I think, you know, like, do you have any questions? Like, Hashem, like, you know, why did he do it so young? Whatever. He told him that did I ask him when he was born why he gave me a healthy, oh healthy, beautiful baby boy? Did I ask him why he gave me 18 years of of him in my life? Did I ask him? So if I didn't ask him for that, then I can't. Wow, that's very powerful. Wow. Wow. Thank him for all the. Wow. The truth is that Rav Avigdor Miller, I love a shalom. Rav Avigdor Miller writes in one of his sfarim that really the answers are in your hand. And the Chachamim tell over a mashal of a little boy, a young boy, who saw a a old Jew walking down the street and he wanted to make fun of him and chepper him, you know, and mock him. So he told his friends, <coughs> look, I'm going to get that Jew. That old Jew took a bird and he says, I'm going to go over to this old man and I'm going to hold the bird in my hand and I'm going to tell him to tell me if he thinks the bird is alive or dead. If he tells me the bird is dead, I'm going to produce the bird. Ooh, he's wrong. If he tells me the bird is alive, I'm going to squeeze the bird, kill the bird, and open the hand and tell him either way he's wrong. So takes the bird in his hand and he goes over to the old man and he says, old man, I have a bird in my hand. Tell me, is it dead or is it alive? So the old man says to him, you're asking me? You should know. So he says, what do you mean? He says, the bird is in your hands. You know. If the bird is alive or not, the answer is in your hands. Same thing here. Kedosh Baruch Hu says, life and death, so to speak, the answers to life's mysteries are in your hands, in the palm of your hands. Meaning, like we said tonight, if you would access the truth, you wouldn't know why all these things are happening. You would not push the truth away. And Rav Victor Miller in his farm tells us some of these truths. And he says, sadly, if, if most of us would embrace the truth and rectify that truth, or actually do away with the shekel to do the tikkun of the truth, then, then we would have all the answers and then the geula would come. But sadly, we have that game. That, you know, emet ve shekel game. Is it dead or is it alive? It's in your hands. You know the answer to that. Why is this galut? You know the answer to that. Why six million Jews perished in the Shoah? You know the answer to that. Why the Inquisition? You know the answer to that. Why how come the Jews, 80% uh, of Jews died in time? You know the answers to these questions. Today, I mean, the switching of the, they got rid of the government, they <coughs> a new leader. I think every country in the world is not happy with their leader. So we're all right for Hashem coming back. And it's not just one man at the Kotel. You have thousands of people who are crying. <laughs> You're very good. Thank you for saying that because the truth is that underneath the Dubna Magid's words were very, very hidden codes of what, were, what was going to happen in future times. And, and of course you see that because the whole world has been replaced with new regimes that are out to do what? Replace the king. Change the entire... <coughs> the entire plan of the creation itself. Simulev. The creation is, itself is being uprooted. I don't have to yeah. detail it for you. I believe you understand it all by yourself. Habriyatsma mit hapechet. Because they're trying to uproot the Ribbonoshan Olam. Today in a courtroom, it used to be that you would put your right hand on the Bible because you have to have accountability to whom? To the one and only one. You would raise your left hand or something like that, either left, I don't remember which one, doesn't matter. And they would say to you, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. And notice 
the emphasis is always on what? How many times did they say this word? Do you swear to tell the truth? The whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. Oh, that's those are very significant words. Because truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth redeems you. Otherwise, so help you God, right? Now, notice today they give you they don't give you a Bible anymore in a courtroom. They give you the Constitution, a book that's the laws of the land, the Constitution. And you put your, your hand on the Constitution and you raise your hand and they say, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Where's God? Who cares? They don't care about God. And like as if you really care about those laws. As if you now put your, your right hand on the Constitution, yeah, I swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, yeah. So help you who? So help you who? So help you who? You have no accountability to anybody. <coughs> and today, even if you lie, it's okay. It's okay. Murderers are being set free after two hours of being incarcerated. So what? Hello. So what you said is 100% true, but why is Hashem doing all of this? Hashem is doing all of this so that you can finally recognize the emet the whole truth and nothing but the truth with the help of Hashem not so help you with the help of Hashem so that you can bring him back to the fold and Be'ezrat Hashem it will happen soon and that's why we say Berachamim why do we want Hashem to come back Berachamim? because if he comes any other way it won't be good so we ask Berachamim that all those that unfortunately didn't heed the call and all those that didn't respond appropriately to the galut and instead they spoke from two sides of their mouth but we want those who are living in the galut to understand that investing in that place like the Chafetz Chaim said right what do I need furniture for if this is not my home why, why should I invest in this place it's not my home why should I plant my roots here it's not my home that's the message and here is a different message because we're already here here is already be more medagdek in certain things and you know make sure we're doing the right and certainly in Eretz Yisrael certain mitzvot have to be kept the right way because your every step that you <coughs> you take on Admat Kodesh is a more serious crime Nahon? so yes we have different but I'm talking about those who are not investing in Tzion they're afraid of Tzion and they're using everything and everyone is an excuse not to come to Tzion and then they tell Hashem Okay, so come. Let's see. Start the movement.